And the final aspect around information-based solutions is looking at data security and data privacy and exploring the technical aspects of these social issues. So data security for students in primary often involves learning about how to use passwords. Quite a challenge for our younger students. Um, through to when they need to encrypt or decrypt a file, maybe if they want to protect it, so if it's their diary, uh, and things of that nature, which leads into the concept of privacy. Uh, and the privacy aspect we focus most on the um, inadvertent sharing of data where we should be trying to keep that private rather than making it public. Um, children, by their by definition, are irresponsible. They haven't yet developed full responsibility, so they will make mistakes. They will do things that they shouldn't, and sharing data inappropriately um, can be one of those. Now, unfortunately, one of the aspects of, of sharing data is that it can be permanent. Once it is shared, it is often difficult to retrieve that data, to correct that mistake. So it's important that students understand when it is appropriate to share and when it's inappropriate. And of course, it does lead into other um, possibilities as well around cyber safety and security, around communicating with um, people that they shouldn't be communicating with and being involved in other aspects of um, their own personal safety. But in terms of digital technologies, the focus is on the technical aspects of data security and data privacy. Now, this intersects quite a bit with the social aspects which are part of digital literacy, that it is also important to develop, but that is not necessarily part of the assessment aspects of the learning outcomes. They are learning outcomes in terms of digital literacy, but that's not assessed. The focus is more on the technical processes involved. But that said, because they are so significant an issue, um, digital technologies does address some of the um, social and behavioral aspects of data security and data privacy. So for the youngest students, it's mostly about just learning the idea of securing data, and mostly that's through passwords. Um, being able to have a password, which means you've got access to doing something on a computer or not access to. You can access some information or you can't access it. Um, relatively simple concepts around that element. Then looking at the idea that certain um, websites and applications and apps will ask for personal information and when it is appropriate for that information to be shared and when it's inappropriate and when they can share it or when they should seek um, their parental, parental permission to share it or their teacher permission in a classroom environment to share information. So these are things that are developed progressively over students' um, schooling, and digital technologies takes on the responsibility of developing these behavioral processes. In years um, three and four, it's more around how to make a password that is secure, that it can be easily remembered, that it can't be easily guessed. Um, so not just learning about how to use a password, but now learning about how to um, use more effective passwords for their purpose, which is around securing information so that others don't have access to it. Others can't guess their password. Now, part of that also is learning not to share their password. Again, a big challenge for young children who are naturally trusting and um, easily happy to share their passwords with their friends, but also almost anyone else that asks them for them. So these are again skills that are learnt slowly and young children will make mistakes but they do so in an um, educational environment that is robust enough to protect them when those mistakes are made. But for your own purposes too, looking at the idea of a secure password and how um, complex and the characteristics of a password should be to make it secure. Now, passwords themselves are a transient technology. They won't be around in another five or so years. We have new technologies coming on board um, which will replace passwords. Biometric data, which takes fingerprints or 
iris images and whole voice prints and so forth, but also um, the use of multi-factor authentication, where we have devices that we physically have with us that help us authenticate when we need to get access to um, online and digital tools. Now, in schools, that's a bit more of a challenge because we generally restrict students' use of personal mobile devices, um, which are the most common uses of uh, multi-factor authentication. But there are alternatives such as having little physical dongles that um, students can uh, press and will give them a series of numbers that they can put in and authenticate themselves. But for young children, that has its own challenges of losing their dongles and misplacing them and all the rest. So it's a challenge. So in schools, we'll have passwords for a bit longer, but in wider society, they are certainly on their way out. The other aspect we need students need to look at is around um, activities that may be designed to try to get access to their information. Hacking, um, pawning, range of different um, terminologies. But the idea is that students have personal information, personal accounts that they wish to keep personal, like their personal diary. Um, but in terms of online material, we tend to restrict a lot more than just our personal diaries. Um, and there are ways of going about that and ways of particularly use of passwords and so forth, having multiple accounts for different things so that we don't lose everything if one of them is compromised, various other approaches that students can go through. And as one activity you can um, look at is whether or not your own um, email address or whether or not your own data has been released out onto the internet um, and you can put in your email address or your phone number and see if any of the data collections that are associated with that email address or phone number are available for purchase on the internet. Uh, so a few other things that students could then look at as they go up in their years. The idea of digital data having permanence. That once it's made available on the, to the internet, that it can then be there for a long time. Not necessarily forever. Um, that is a bit of a misnomer. Um, one of the issues with digital data is that it does have a life expectancy. Um, a lot of the data that I created 10, 20 years ago is no longer available. Some of it was on formats that can no longer be read. Some of it was encrypted in systems and in various um, different applications that no longer exist. Um, so the idea of data being always available forever is wrong. We shouldn't teach that. But data will be around for a lot longer than we may anticipate, and it may be used by others that we may not expect um, well into our later years. So certainly within um, into their university time and their first jobs. So considering that, we have what's called our digital footprint which is the information that is publicly available about us. Now, one other misnomer is the idea that a zero digital footprint is a good thing. That can actually be really problematic. Some of you as teachers may have tried to main, or potential teachers may have tried to maintain a zero digital footprint. One of the first things your prospective employer, your principal is going to do is do a search for you on the internet. If there is nothing available, they have got nothing on which to base any opinion about you. So if they've got a choice between you and another uh, prospective applicant that has a digital footprint and it displays them as a upstanding um, citizen that's involved in a whole range of appropriate activities and doing a range of different things, then that's probably going to be a more likely hire than someone that has zero digital footprint. Now, of course, conversely, having a negative digital footprint showing you drunken at parties and being arrested and whatever else might be um, about you, that can be problematic. Now, if that is the case, where there is some material like that available for you, it's probably in your best interest to develop a much more extensive digital footprint that would minimize that small amount, hopefully, that is negative um, that people will find about you. Of course, people are going to look for information about you. Um, your students definitely will, their parents will, principal, other teachers. Digital footprints exist 
and they do provide information about us. We should be learning how to control and manage that digital footprint so that it presents how we would like to be perceived, just as we would if we walk into a, into a room in terms of how we dress, how we um, present ourselves, how we talk and interact with others. We're presenting a physical footprint of ourselves, our persona, so is our digital personas. Now, one aspect you may want to consider is the idea of having a professional persona and a personal persona, one that you share and express with your friends and your family, or indeed you might have multiple ones, one for your family, one for your friends, um, where you can express yourself differently in those different ways. But your most publicly presented persona, particularly as a teacher, should generally be the cleanest, most appropriate one. Of course, there is an expectation on how teachers present themselves and behave. Um, of course, you are role models for your students. Like it or not, it is an imposition on teachers, but it is one that certainly exists, particularly if you go to a small town um, and it can really make a significant difference. So things to think about, but of course, in teaching your students, you're teaching them about their own digital persona and their digital footprint that they leave when they share information online.